Welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Machine Learning. I'm one of your hosts, Michael Burke, and I do machine learning and data engineering at Databricks. And I'm joined by my amazing, lovely co-host. Ben Wilson. Uh, I help make your prompt engineering dreams come true by making it simpler at Databricks. Oh, man. That sounds enticing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's cool. So today we have Roman Grebenikov. Uh, he got his PhD in computer science, and after graduating, he worked as a big data engineer, ML lead, focusing on recommendation and search, and is now the principal engineer, there's only one allowed, at Delivery Hero. So, Roman, after graduating from school, you jumped into the deep end of the big data world, working in very complex ecosystems. So how did you pick up the skills coming out of college to be successful in that realm? just being curious about how things work so there were no like a specific type of school you can attend after university and then you just get your skills just natural curiosity i think that's probably the best answer i've ever heard somebody answer that question uh i think that's what makes a good software engineer period good developer ml engineer whatever you want to call it is is that curiosity and that's that, in my experience. That's what sets the truly amazing people who just excel at at building stuff from people that are collecting a paycheck or punching the card or just building whatever people are asking them to build. So excellently put. I have a question though. So I'm a very curious person by nature, and I love rabbit holes. So for instance, we just got a request from a customer to explain all the different compression types for Delta, which is the data format at Databricks, and basically what are the pros and cons of each. And I was like, this is amazing. And I could easily sink, I don't know, 15, 20 hours into just learning how this stuff works. So do you ever experience that curiosity can kill the cat? Mm, So once I started an open source project and it took me a two years and it's still 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 going on yeah so this happens uh so the i, I can just give you some intro about this project probably you've heard, seen it in my cv it's meta rank so i'm a, a person doing mostly informational retrieval search ranking and all that stuff and uh, the problem I observed multiple times in multiple companies that everyone is just reinventing the wheel when things uh, are related to ranking. So, and, uh, but there are no open source tooling available for that. So I've seen just exactly the same systems in different companies written in different languages doing exactly the same thing, like some basic feature computations, happening offline, online, then some inference, happening in real time Uh, but at the end if you're going through e-commerce world for example it's just even the features are the same like some sort of different ways of counting clicks uh, in the current years a bit of uh, embeddings and all that cosine similarity bm25 and you just collect everything together put some machine learning on top to predict the ranking and quality So I decided, why don't we make an open source project about that? And uh, I thought that maybe like in a month I will do something which will work, but it's uh, already two years and it's, it's kind of working, but uh, uh, it's just the beginning. (laughs) Nice. So what is the core infrastructure of MetaRank Labs? Like what is your core offering? You know, MetaRank Labs is just two guys in the basement doing open source on like on a free time. So it's not like you know a labs with where people in the white uh, costumes doing science. So it's more like a computer science type of science. When you read some paper and think, why don't we just you know train our own embedding model? Why not? Got it. So you guys are two guys in a basement, but what, what exactly, if I go and sign up for your product, what exactly does it offer? Uh, everyone is trying to treat it as a product, you know, like in a startup when we came through 
Y Combinator and you can get SaaS or just pay for something. So you got you you can go on a GitHub and get it like the whole offering in a single tarball. Yeah, but uh, product wise, it's just uh, so how to compare to existing things. Uh, so it's more like opinionated way of doing ranking. So you ingest your data, what you're actually going to rank, ingest your telemetry, how people interact with this data, define what is important for ranking, literally just ranking features. And uh, it's just a wide collection, a rich collection of different templates, like click-through rates on all that stuff, user agent parsing, some embeddings, B encoders, cross encoders, all that stuff. And then you just uh, train the final model, like Lambda Mart on this offline set of data and uh, go online with hopefully better ranking. Usually people do it like by themselves in some scary Python scripts, but uh, you can have another set of scary uh, Scala scripts instead of your scary Python scripts. But still, a good thing about the Scala scripts is that they are maintained by someone else. <laughs> Very well put. So I'm interested in the process that you took. And I'm glad that you said it's an opinionated take. Uh, as somebody who's built a couple of these before in different companies, um, the core fundamentals of it, exactly as you said, it's the same thing. It's not like you're re-implementing some bespoke algorithm from scratch and saying, hey, we need to get super creative here. There's only so many ways that people can interact with a ranked, you know, ordered set of material. And you you can only collect data in so many different ways, like valuable data, at least, that informs how people are interacting. Like, oh, do we attach, you know, click through on this or, you know, amount of time paused on an app when they're looking at, at items, you can collect data like that or purchases uh, for e-commerce. But when you boil it down, it, the implementations that happen at different places, at different companies, or even within the same large company and different use cases of these, the code's different, but the fundamental structure is is very similar. Um, what was your process for distilling what that core set of components and features need to be when you're approaching a project like this? So usually, if you feel like a physical pain writing yet another take on implementing click-through rate on a window on the historical data, that's like a perfect time for just making it an, as an open source bit of code. So for me, this click-through rate was, and just counting clicks in a different uh, ways, like offline, online, rolling window, within some data storage, or just in Spark directly. It was like the last, <clears throat> uh, the last point. So I was I can't handle it anymore, and then like. <laughs> Screw it, I will just make an open source thing about that. So that's why it's opinionated. So when you had a couple of rounds implementing the same thing in different companies, sometimes you just see it as, a, as the same thing. So if someone will ask me to yet to implement it once more, then uh, I will probably struggle a lot. Got it. Do you have a list of sort of core components, both Ben and, and Roman, when you think about developing a sort of a search algorithm or a rank algorithm? Uh, can you make an example which components can, can it be? Sure. So there's the classic feature engineering, then build a model, then serve the model. But within that, are there subject specific technologies or structures that you always use when working with search or rank algorithms? For the data structures, it's a complicated topic. But for me, like if you build something related to ranking, probably 95% of the time you will spend just messing with data, making it pro properly collected, ingested, cleared, processed in a way that you can compute your features offline, online. And just all this machine learning is like a cherry on top of the pie. You just throw XGBoost there and that's all machine learning you did. 
And surprisingly, it works. So it's most of it is about feature engineering and even this cool ways of doing ranking with neural networks can be seen as a way of doing feature engineering. So if you're using LLMs in the way with this cosine similarity between embeddings, it's, you know, just a number. You put it as a feature in the ranking model. It's a quite advanced number computed on a GPU, but still at the end, it's just ranking feature. Yeah, I would 100% agree with the component aspect of that. The core of, even if you're using like sort of traditional rank and search algorithms that doesn't use any sort of deep learning, you know, you're using sort of matrix factorization techniques in order to compute what the, the effective you know, probability that user A is going to interact with, you know, item 317. Even when you look at that algorithm and look at the source code for it, it's like, okay, it's it's fairly complex. There's a lot of moving pieces in here. And okay, I'm going to have to look at, at some of my old, you know, grad school textbooks to remember how all this math works that they're doing. But the thing is, somebody already built it. It's already out there. It's a standard. So that aspect of, of the projects, the ML aspect, it's really just... Are you crafting the data in such a way that the algorithm can accept it and making sure that you're going through and filtering out bad data, garbage data, identifying users that are, that are effectively poisoning your data set because somebody's trying to figure out how your system works and they created a bot network that's just spamming, you know, repeated patterns over and over. You have to identify that sort of problematic data, remove it. Um, but then, as you said, Roman, like the, some of the cool stuff, like the sentence transformers library using like a BART model and you're taking, you know, unstructured text that describes say a product that you're selling and you want to say, okay, we're out of product B. We sold out of it two days ago. What do we put in front of the customer that has, you know, that product as their number one highest probability of interaction you need to do you know, similarity search. And then you start getting into the non-data science, but more pure software engineering, you know, side of things where you're like, okay, I need a, a vector embedding database. I need something that's in memory that I can do a search lookup of an embedding, a fixed length embedding vector and use, you know, but most of those algorithms that do all of that and the math behind them, it's not like you're, you're doing pure data science work and implementing that stuff from scratch. There's packages that do that. You just import it and use it. Yeah. Current data science is often glue, just gluing open source libraries together and just hitting deploy and see and hear some sirens, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then go back and realize that it's, it's always a data issue. It's yeah. very seldom an, an algorithm problem. Yeah. Actually, probably that, uh, so for the data, it, it's one of the reasons why MetaRank is not in Python. So Python is uh, like lingua franca of data engineering and data science. But I also do write Python, but uh, I'm not proud of it. Um, <laughs> uh, because you need to do a lot of uh uh, safety nets all around you to make sure that you are not uh, doing bad things with types, for example. So schema, different validations, you need to do it manually in, in a more strict and type safe language. It comes uh, handled usually by either a compiler or a library. And it, it, it works fine with Python when you're just doing a green field project. You just write some code, it somehow works. And then this code grows to 100,000 lines in a couple of years. And then you decided to do refactoring and then, oops. Uh, so because you need to fit, so you can't just easily refactor because uh, just too many dependencies. With strictly strict languages, it's usually 
you do some refactoring and then just make it compile and usually it works. So with, uh, with Python and less type safe languages, you need to be sure it's covered well in tests and just have a lot of integration tests, all, the, all that stuff, but they are mm, so not replaced with the strict language, but uh, you can focus more on the business side of things while writing these tests and not like uh, you put string here and it should emit string there. Yeah, Ben, is that your experience that Python requires more tests than typed languages? Uh, uh, yeah, as yeah. somebody who did the inverse of what, what you I, did I guess Roman. people are not just writing this because, you know, it takes time, whatever, just I do something, deploy it, and see it in a production. Yeah, I'd say, like, I don't work on ML projects anymore. Uh, I work on the tools that people use to build ML projects and our, you know, the main code base that we work on is ML flow, which is hundred percent in Python. But I did the opposite thing that a lot of people do. I started in Scala. That was like my first ML programming language. I was building my projects in that. I also did Python back in the day, very bad Python. Um, but Scala is that safety net. Exactly. As you said, you get away with, viewer tests uh, just by code coverage alone. Like you don't have to do as many, I'd call them unit test plus or integration test minus. They're, they're somewhere in between the two of those where you're, you're simulating large chunks of your code base in order to make sure that, or have validation that, hey, I'm calling this higher level API here with data that's simulating how a user would use it. And I, I'm, I'm not evaluating the performance and functionality of a single function or a single method. I'm instantiating an object and then I'm running three or four method calls on that in order to see how does it behave across all of these different steps. It's not a full integration test, but it's definitely not a unit test. So you have to do stuff like that in Python or else you're going to get burned with the whole like, yeah, I put a type hint in there and that'll complain within an IDE that, hey, this doesn't really make sense. You can override that at runtime. There's no control over that saying, hey, you can't do this. You can write code to enforce that. And then your code, you can turn Python into a pseudo type safe language with putting loads of boilerplate in your code base. But then what you're doing is you're not, getting that compile time performance and benefit, what you're doing is just creating an exception th throwing factory and it's going to annoy users. So like, Hey, uh, you know, this, this used to support an int 32. I'm now passing an int 64 in like, why does this not work anymore? It's like, well, we have a, an assertion here in our code that says this, it must be this exact type. It's annoying. Um, but in a language like Scala or anything really based on the JVM, <coughs> you have to declare all that stuff. You can't pass in. I mean, Scala, you could pass in an anonymous type, like just any or any val. But hopefully you're, whoever's reviewing your code is going to slap your hand if you put stuff like that everywhere in the code. And the compiler should complain. There is even plugins for automatically slapping your head, hands <laughs> while, while you do it. <clears throat> Yeah, there's a startup idea right there. <laughs> it's already um, there on GitHub, yeah, yeah. so it's, it shouldn't be a startup idea. <laughs> yeah, you can put uh, it in like IntelliJ and have it automatically just tell you, like, I'm not going to compile this because you, here's some issues that I see in your code. Got it. Yeah, I was going one step further <laughs> and actually getting a physical hand, but I guess it didn't land real well. Um, so I wanted to also ask Roman, how do you think about serving these search algorithms? Because typically search applications require really low latency. I forget the, the actual stats, but Google saw massive drops in conversion rate or um, click-through rate with even a millisecond increase in latency. So how do you achieve this super high performance? Uh, 
I actually haven't. I tried to find this, some sort of research about dependency between latency and conversion. It seems to be that it exists, but no one's actually seen it. Uh, and I observed another thing. Uh, so once in my previous company, we were doing e-commerce search. So it's you, you control the whole pipeline, the whole funnel of conversion. So you can measure how things happen. And uh, what we measured is that adding X, so we did an A-B test. You, we just added, uh, you know, a thread sleep for 200 milliseconds for a small segment of traffic and tried to measure. Well, uh, so we had just a free tire customers. So when you're not paying for products, you might expect that you are the product. So we were experimenting quite a lot on this customer. So we just added 200 milliseconds and tried to measure if the conversion will drop or not. It didn't like yeah. I mean, no, everyone got used though. Everything is so slow on internet, like 200 milliseconds. No one cares because your web, uh, 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 one page app through which pulls one megabyte of JSON loads for three seconds, who cares about extra 200 milliseconds in practice. There was a study done at Northeastern university, I think over a decade ago where they actually tried to do a proper statistical analysis of this exact phenomenon. And that was the internet back then. And so before, uh, you know, modern cellular networks that behave basically like broadband internet now, but that I, I don't have the exact data to mind right now, but I do remember it was, there was a big threshold leap at five seconds and another one at 20 seconds where that's when people started to get kind of annoyed. And I think that's relative to what they're expecting elsewhere on the internet. If you're like, Hey, if I go to Amazon and I'm searching around, yeah, their, their response budget for uh, latency on uh, the Amazon's main page or their search. Yeah. They're measuring that in, you know, tens of milliseconds for each of the different phases. If you look at total browser load time, it's, they're going to freak out if that browser takes longer than about, a, you know, 200 milliseconds to load up. But most websites, you can't afford that infrastructure. Uh, it's expensive to run stuff like that. Um, but if, if similar websites are not that performant, you don't stand out that much and people are kind of inured to like, oh, if I go to this this clothing company's website, I'm expecting uh, it's like takes three or four seconds for things to load on the page, or the app takes you know five seconds to load the next page. People get used to it, and they don't have gross expectations. So it's always I've always found it kind of annoying when that conversation comes up, and it has with me many times where somebody says, "Here's the here's the budget for this response to this REST API for the ML team." You only have 50 milliseconds to return results. I'm like, how long does the page load? Like in total, like, well, the, the page loads in 270 milliseconds. Like, great. Can you tell the difference between a page that takes one second to load and one that takes 270 milliseconds to load? No. It, it looks almost instantaneous to, to people. You can tell the difference between one second and 20 seconds. So. It's definitely worth looking for that that study if anybody's curious because they, they did do a very comprehensive study of that focused around e-commerce. I guess five seconds is uh, the like, like a threshold you can just sit and stare on your phone waiting until page loads and five seconds you just start doing something else but still in the background focused on your page and if it won't load in a half a sec half a minute probably you just, okay, whatever, I will try next time. Yeah. You think it's broken. Like the website's just not responsive Yeah, or some app has crashed or something. Yes. Yeah. Right, so well, people will reload the page multiple times. So for latency, if you speak about search, it's usually two parts. The first is retrieval. The second is ranking and retrieval, uh, 
it's usually not that bad if you are not doing bad things in your search, like handling everything on a single Postgres instance, because Postgres has full text search. Uh, and for the ranking, it also depends on the things you are doing there. But at the end, it's usually a balance between your budget and uh, like latency and precision. So you're trying to balance in this triangle, choosing two out of three. Um, so you can have go faster and make more relevant results, but you need to throw a couple of uh, packs of dollars to the Amazon so to make it work. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember back at my prior company, Tubi, which is video streaming, like movies and TV shows, we were working on search. And I don't know if they, they're still doing this because uh, the information is becoming out of date. But we used Algolia and we were prototyping. And essentially what would happen is a data scientist or a data analyst would go in and determine what rules should be served offline. And then it would just be a simple rule-based system. So if you type in this query, like X, Y, Z, it will return these five results. If you type in sharks, it will return this, these 10 results. And that was in the spirit of minimizing latency. And it would just be a massive lookup table. And uh, it was interesting that that was a, a very core offering of Algolia. I'm sure they have other products as well. Um, but there's so many different uh, ways to approach this. It's, it's kind of cool. I always considered that Algolia were quite focused on the latency. And um, uh, <laughs> in the um, community of search engineers, Algolia are kind of a weird company because they were sharing quite a lot of things we are doing inside, they are doing inside internally before, I don't know, maybe 2016. And then they started growing and uh, they uh, kept silent till then. And uh, two years ago, they published an article that uh, neural networks for, for search doesn't work. Like, no way. And uh, uh, a year ago, they published another article that they do indeed work. And now it's like, are you sure that they work? Because you just wrote a giant article describing that, no, that's not we shouldn't, the industry shouldn't move in this direction. Yeah, I think it's already moved. Uh -huh. It's already moved. And probably <laughs> that's why we, they um, uh, decided to have another take on this topic. Yeah, that sounds like a marketing <laughs> department that went off the rails. And then some engineer was like, actually, we need to, we need to revisit this because people are making fun of us. Mm, yeah, they're still doing. <laughs> yeah, it's always weird to me when when people backtrack like that about tech statements. They're trying to be prescient and saying this is never going to work for this thing. It's, it's kind of like that luddite mentality. You know, they know this one thing, and they don't want any. They don't want to change themselves, but they also don't want anybody else to change or innovate. I guess that the Algolia with their like commercial growth when you start growing fast enough uh your marketing and management uh, one and technical people are just there to make things running and uh, so that's probably the reason why they stopped posting anything technical about your internal things um and uh, for the neural networks I got the impression that, so Algolia, before they were seeing how it works, uh, they use an internal uh, search engine. So it's not Lucene, not Elastic, that's fully internal one, um, with all the search implemented in C++. So it's a pretty uh, scary thing to do. So probably they spent quite a lot of time optimizing the core this term search though. So, so they built something which is better than Lucene at the end. And mm -hmm. then mm, this neural networks came and they were saying like, okay, you're already obsolete. No one cares about term search. This uh, GPT is the future and you can't just pivot that fast 
into a completely different area. So you start trying to find reasons why you are not doing this pivot and you start seeing that, okay, that's probably not the best idea for us and for the industry to move there because you know, it's hard, hard to beat old good term search. But seems to be that in some areas, um, there are a lot of another opinions on this topic. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting topic to discuss, just in general, as as its approach to search. How do you think the landscape's going to look in five years? When, like, yeah, ChatGPT four is awesome. DaVinci is even better. These massive large language models can do so much and, but they're not, they're not open source. You know, they're, they're highly closed source because they cost so much money to make. And these companies want to make a profit off of their SaaS offerings. But then you have Meta who's releasing Llama, its core out there saying, Hey, we're not in the business of making money off these things. We want to help the world innovate. And the best way to do that is to open source this model as well as the code that built it. So here you go, world, go nuts. And there's already people retraining that architecture and doing it. And the results are even better than the initial models. With that process and the, the new research that's coming out of places like MIT and Stanford for the next generation that succeeds Transformers, when these models get smaller and smaller and cheaper to actually deploy, do you see search having a paradigm shift globally, like in industry where we're no longer thinking of it as we have tabular data or, you know, vectorized data in the form of features that we're, we're trying to retrieve relevant information, but more moving towards natural language where somebody can actually take the speaker on their phone in an app and just ask for something as they would in a store to an employee and actually relevant things come from a series of these, these large models, you know, like you know, the front end is whisper, which has a language head on the end of it, which then goes into a, you know, a generative model. And that's been instructed and trained to provide an itemized list of things that are available within a table somewhere. Do you see that as, as something that is going to take off or do you think that's just not really going to go anywhere. In, in some areas, probably yes. Uh, uh, so, but uh, you're uh, going on some sort of a specific store and ask your uh, for support, and you got a response. That as an AI language model, I cannot say to you because, like, you know, we decided that this topic is taboo. Um, um, so it's or. Uh, Maybe from another perspective, uh, this AI language model will say you hallucinate about things it doesn't know. Like, okay, you need to do this and that. And uh, should you really? Like, okay, uh, which medicine should I take right now? Because I have the symptoms. Like, okay, take this. <laughs> Highly recommend it on Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. The the existing web pages are sort of a disclaimer where you're free of blame. It's it's on the onus of the user to figure out what is relevant, what is correct. And if you have an LLM, you're only provided one answer. And so now the burden sort of shifts to the LLM. So maybe that could be a, a blocker in the adoption of this. I've seen an ideas of some sort of a hybrid approach. So LLM is not used for the actual retrieval. So you have still documents. For example, you're, you're a lawyer and you're looking for a specific keys matching your query. And uh, it's not like LLM will hallucinate your specific keys for your query because it would be quite awkward, uh, but it might expand your query. So like, okay, that's the that's the problem I got. It will generate you a query for an existing corpora of documents, which later is used for retrieval. So at the end, it would be just the same documents, no, no hallucinations, but just this retrieval step is expanded or optimized by LLM. Uh, 
So it might get some extra context from you, maybe just with a couple of questions like, okay, in which state, for example, or some other questions regarding to the keys, and then just formulate a specific query. You might not even see this query at the end. You just have a conversation and you got your results, but these results are not generated by chat GPT. Yeah, can confirm a uh, meeting on, on Monday this week uh, with a team that's trying to use something that we just built in MLflow for you know, supporting integrations with these different services. And it's almost exactly what they're doing. Um, they're using the OpenAI ChatGPT4 prompt uh, in order to, they've, they basically provide a prompt that says, hey, robot, I want you to do the following things. When, a, when somebody asks you a question related to these topics, that are relevant to the product we're building. I want you to expand this to at least 400 words, but no more than 1000 words in your response that describes exactly what, as much as you can about the nature of what they're asking for. And it does that. It generates these blocks of text that kind of describe in incredible detail, unique attributes associated with what they're trying to search for. And then they get the embedding from that. So they take that text, embed that text, and now they have a search factor term. That's, you know, length of, I guess 384 is the length. So it's just a, basically an array of floats. And then they're using that against the vector database to find like which documents in this massive, you know, repository that those have already been, you know, their key is that vector, that search factor. And then they just have metadata that associates to okay, where on S3 is this file that we need to retrieve and return? And it'll do that and say, hey, I want top K10. Give me the 10 closest documents. And it is crazy how good it is. Like it blows out of the water their, their pre-existing thing. Their big thing is like, hey, this is going to be expensive for us to turn this on because each request to ChatGPT, they got to pay OpenAI for that. Um, so they're they're desire was, can we do this with an open source model? Probably the answer is yes, but you're going to still pay quite a lot for a GPU inference. Yes. The hosting of all of those is, yeah. is going to be big. I mean, they're a big company. They have a lot of money, but they just don't want to be paying a service for something that they feel like they could just pay for a VM to run it. For European companies, it's also a bit of a problem for privacy perspective. So if it's a search query, who knows what I'm searching on your search box. Maybe I'm just putting my passport number there or whatever. Should we really send it overseas to chat GPT API? It's mm, uh, a questionable thing. So formally you can do this with a lot of different safety nets from lawyers, but uh, usually all the product people, when they hear the idea of sending it, they're like, they have absolutely scared face of like, scared of the interaction with their lawyer department, how it can be handled properly. So better not. And if you can host it inside your perimeter, that's wonderful. And technically training, uh, not the training, but more like a fine tuning LLMs is not that a complicated thing at the end. So you can figure it out maybe in a week. And if you have, if you're a large company, you probably won't have any issues just training 10 GPU instances for a week. So it's not a big deal, but that's, so even uh, hobby uh, meshing learners can afford that. Uh, for me, it's uh, used 4090 here on the bottom, uh, but uh, for companies, it's just renting it uh, on the cloud. And rent, rent prices are just going down. Mm -hmm. So on Amazon, not likely, not, not that much going down, but you can, V V100 is like $2, $2 per hour right now outside of Amazon, like more obscure, uh, new age hostings, but still 
two hours for an hour for two two dollars for an hour and training is like a couple of hundreds of hours so it's it's manageable one training event and vm hosting of your app for an entire year is probably what you would pay a software provider who's providing that service in a week of usage for the volumes that you're you're looking at yeah, but usually inference is quite much cheaper. So like, I don't know, cheapest Amazon instance uh, with GPU with T4 is 300 or 400 bucks a month. So not that much. It's enough to handle some basic sized models. Llama is probably okay. Uh, something 65 billion parameters, not okay. Uh, but it's it's doable. I see. Uh, I saw like uh, some team. They during the hackathon they uh, got a data set of the subreddit called "Dad's Jokes," so about horrible jokes, and uh, they fine tuned uh, a llama on that. And uh, there was like a not a prompt engineering, but you might start typing something and it tries to make a very bad joke out of your prompt <laughs> and it seems to be working quite fine but still it's it's not covered by some brands or something it's just people running experiments on their own hardware yeah it's, the, it's truly the democratization of deep learning like effective useful deep learning because you could do you know historically you could take a pre-trained you know, CNN, those were the big things, you know, eight, 10 years ago. It's like, oh my God, CNNs are amazing. It can classify images. Like, yeah, it can. But if you're taking an ImageNet trained model, it's good at generalized classification of images because it was trained on billions of images at Google. But when you try to retrain that on your own image sets, you notice that there are certain things it just doesn't do well with. And you rapidly, when you're trying to do retraining of one of those, you learn that, okay, in order to really bring the accuracy up on our bespoke use case, this is going to cost a lot of money to retrain this. So you're only looking at big enterprise com companies who have a, a vested interest in that project becoming successful because they know they're going to make a profit off of it for them to say, yeah, here's $1.5 million budget to retrain this. You know, not a lot of data science teams have ever heard something like that. But now with these LLMs and the transformers architecture, even for vision models and audio models, yeah, you can train it on a desktop computer. It's crazy, like how far we've come. And from what I hear from the, the new stuff that Stanford's working on, that's going to, in the next couple of years, it's going to be, you can retrain that on your cell phone, like that size and not need for extreme, I mean, you're still going to need, you know, things that can process tensors, um, which phones are now having those built on their SOCs anyway. Um, but they'll be small enough where you, you know, the same predictive power inference capability of, of something like, you know, GPT 3.5 or Llama uh, can fit on a cell phone in memory. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, we recently had a hackathon at Databricks and uh, my team didn't have enough cool stuff to submit a, a final video, but what we were working on was a transformer-based time series forecast. And with one of the smallest GPU instances on Azure, we were able to train uh, in like 15 minutes or something with like a reasonable amount of epochs with uh, hyperparameter tuning and everything. So uh, it, yeah, the democratization of this is really cool. Hopefully it'll get, it'll lead to a lot of like small sub products and, and pieces of innovation that build off of the, the transformer framework. Uh, At delivery hero, just quick question about that. Do you guys look to use transformers a lot or what exactly are you guys focusing on as, in terms of cutting edge tech? So it's a pretty large company. So it's hard to say about everyone. And I don't know everyone. It's like 3000 people or the level developers. And uh, I'm just only in a specific domain of search. So maybe some, so I know people are using transformers here and there, and, but for, uh, 
so I can't say a lot because it's kind of publicly traded company. I have some fear of saying too much, <laughs> but like, why not at the end? So everyone is using it. Yeah. So okay. for, for, um, for, for, me, is... for me personally, like I see it as a, um, so for multi so what, what deliver here probably never as, as Americans you probably never heard about what's that and it, it's more like an umbrella company of different food delivery brands across the world so I don't know how many of them are there like 80 in many countries but not in the United States so you can see it as a like a DoorDash but uh, outside of US and um, It's a problem of multilingual processing. So you have a lot of languages and all of them are important. You don't have a, an imbalance of the internet when everything is in English. Not everything is in English, especially if you're speaking about food delivery. You, everyone wants to get food and not just only people speaking English in different countries. So. But building pipelines on all the languages is usually a major pain because English is fine, uh, but good luck with Hebrew or maybe traditional Chinese uh, because it's just not yet well developed in, in open source. There are some different projects, but it's still not mature enough. And with transformers, you can get all this uh, things for free. So it's just a good baseline. Doesn't mean that it's the best thing in the world, but uh, with the transformer approach to search, uh, you're already um, getting very strong baseline. Sometimes even better than Elasticsearch gives to, gives to you with like out of the box analyzers. Got it. And then, what are you specifically focusing on at Delivery Hero? Uh, that's a good question. So I'm just. Uh, running in circles and screaming usually uh, so <laughs> so i don't work on us uh, not always spend much time on a specific products but more like convincing convincing other people to do the right thing so especially when they're doing something weird so that's yeah, do you have of, an example for us <clears throat> or are you just going to leave it at that? Uh, so for example, uh, it's more about, uh, making other people, uh, do the hard work, but you just, uh, trying to make a proper hint or question so they can grow. So you got some latency issues in some specific service and you maybe, have you ever tried to use, I don't know. Java async profiler and they're like, no, is it a good thing? And you just show and they see that 80% of their time is spent on a single function call. And they're like, whoa, hmm, interesting. <laughs> then something <laughs> happens and they rewrite this function call and, and your, their service becomes five times faster. No problem. Uh, did I fix this issue? No, they did it. <laughs> But that Basically sums up the uh, job role of a principal engineer perfectly. Kind of, yeah. But you know, you're in, there for wisdom. In a in a month or two, you start seeing that this tool is being used in another team, so it just starts spreading across the company. So you just throw good things on specific people, and people start spreading this knowledge, and and that's it. So mostly speaking, sometimes some prototypes. Nice. Ben, is that your experience as a sort of in a similar role for Databricks? I, I used to be in that role. Now I'm a code monkey, but yeah, a principal in the field at Databricks, that's generally what you do. You might prototype something, you might do a proof of concept, or you might come in to help out a team that's really struggling. But a lot of the time it's like somebody just paste in Slack some code and they're like, Hey, can you tell me if this is good? Like, like empirically good, or you just want some tips on, on how to make it a little bit better. 
uh, or are you asking, would I have written this? And the answer <laughs> to that is generally no, most certainly not. But here's some tips and here's some things to think about to make this not suck so much. And the goal of that isn't just fixing that one problem. It's exactly as Roman said, it's to impart knowledge that you know is going to spread virally to their people that they talk to. And all of a sudden, you know, more and more people get better and better. I think that's the role of any like super senior IC tech person. You're there just, just to make your organization better by virtue of you telling people all the things that you screwed up when you had to learn it the hard way. Yeah. I have some sort of a statistics for me, like just what apps do I use? Where do I spend my time and how much do I work? It's not shared with anyone but me because I don't like anyone know what I'm doing, but I found that I'm the, the mostly, most uh, frequently used tool in my uh, arsenal is Slack. So like that's like three hours, four hours a day, just shit posting in Slack. That's what you usually do. To, to relax, I do shit post in other uh, non-corporate uh, areas, so it's not like only Slack. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Cool. Well, I know we have a, a stop coming up pretty soon, so I'll wrap um, and we can continue on with our lives. So, a couple interesting notes that I heard, at least throughout this this call, is t type languages typically require less unit tests because the compiler will do a lot of the type checking for you. You don't need as structured uh, and extensive unit tests. And then also latency of search impacting conversion is an absolute lie, and any company based on that should just stop right now. And um, that said, that uh, research suggests that latency tolerance is, is more relative. So if maybe 15 years ago, if latency was an average of five seconds, well, uh, maybe a increase in five seconds would be problematic. Now that would be completely intolerable. So it's more about what is the relative latency of not only the competitors, but also the page load. And then finally for search algorithms, there are two core components, retrieval, which typically occurs via an API and then ranking, which can be offline training with an online inference. So Roman, if people want to get in contact with you, where should they go? Mm, on LinkedIn, probably. Cool. Well, there you have it. Until next time, it's been Michael Burke and my co-host. Ben Wilson. And have a good day, everyone. Take it easy.